you know, everyone loves to be seen and appreciated and, um, and everyone loves to be seen and appreciated for whatever, you know, we are and the good that we are and the good that we bring. And when we've forgotten, if we allow ourselves to be seen and appreciated for the good that we are, then we usually are open and vulnerable enough in the really constructive way of being vulnerable, which is really willing to see our soft stuff, vulnerable enough to know that we're off the mark a little bit. And so it's so important to have friends around us, or at least one person, the more the merrier, I suppose, but to at least have one person who you know will always be kind, even when telling the truth. Even if that truth isn't how wonderful you are or how gracious you've been or kind you've been, but really is like something that maybe we think we don't want to hear. How uh, picky we are or how, you know, we don't trust people enough or how we work too much or whatever the story is. You know, we all have stories about ourselves and the world. And even some of us have stories about our close to us family and friends. Some of those stories we never talk to them about. We just have them. And some we talk to them about in no uncertain terms. And we just want them to know that, you know, we have this perception and they need to listen because it's all for love, of course. So when you think about kindness, um, first of all, I, I languaged it with, um, you know, English is such a funny language and I, I work in another language half of my life time now. And, um, and in, in Russian, um, the K of kindness would be the same as K of cornerstone because they both have that same K sound, right? So why would one be K and one be C? It's just like, can't understand that. And so I decided to play with that. But not just because what that does for me is it reminds me that everybody sees things differently. Other people have different rules and different ways and different things they've learned. And if I can only see that it has to be spelt with a C just because I memorized that as a child, and I might correct somebody from another country who, who understands the K sound is a K sound, you know, it's like we need to be really, well, it's not the way I want to say it that we need, but what if we use those double Ks right there that I've put out there? What if we did that to remind us of, of the need to be open and compassionate and to see people where they are and not where th we think they should be. And if we're going to correct them and tell them the truth about the letter K, we can just say, you know, isn't English a funny language? And sometimes it's a C and sometimes it's a K and I have no idea why. So I sure can understand how you did it that way. And that's just a little conversation that is really a microcosm of uh, something that I and practicing for myself, which is how to see um, my response to the things in life that I think don't add up or don't line up correctly or don't, you know, aren't the way they should be. So rather than noticing all of the stuff out there, which used to cause me a lot of grief or make me think I should save the world, or have me work all night long in order to affect some concrete contribution to something, I've kind of 
changed, I mean, yeah, mostly I've kind of changed to the idea that I really need to look at myself. I need to, to spend time understanding how I contribute to the world. What is, what is my general tone? And am I living in peace 10% of the day or 50 or 80 or not? Or, you know, where, what is my part in this world that I'm living in? And so my goal is to be someone who can be kind and honest at the same time. But I no longer need to point things out unless I'm asked to. I'm really practicing not needing to know what's right in every situation, not needing to comment on it, not trying to effect a change in it, not any of those things. Just like notice it and notice what it's doing in me and then decide, is do I like myself that way or not? What is it doing in me? What am I... What is my response to that situation? So, um, so that's why this whole theme is really interesting to me. So I have way more than we can do today, but I wanted to just read a, a couple of things. So the way I organize all of my talks is that the topic is right in the center. And that is that kindness is a cornerstone to support us learning how to live a life of peace. So in my work in Ukraine, I call them stepping stones, that stepping stones are all around the path of peace. And so are stumble stones, which, you know, when you trip over yourself trying to change somebody else or control them or judge them or yourself. So when we stumble on one of those self-righteous things or we're being so honest that it hurts or any of those ways that we're not so proud of, because I'm sure I'm not the only one who has stumble stones in your life, my life. Um, so when you stumble on those things, really the purpose of that is to use it to find the stepping stone right beside, which is kindness in this case. And there's a thousand stepping stones. But when we don't do that, when we let ourselves um, indulge in knowing what's right or even more trying to tell other people what's right, like today I did it this morning, my daughter's moving and she was going to hire these moving guys to help. And today, she last night, she writes me that, that her back is hurt so she's going to bed because her and her daughter are doing the moving. And I wrote and I said, what the heck are you thinking? You can't do you can't do all that. You you know you have big furniture. You need some people to help. You know, and I jumped right in to overdrive, as she calls it, trying to tell her what to do. Well, of course she knows she can't do that, and whatever she's going to do about it is what she's going to do. So I had to see myself even this morning, and so. Um, there's a lot of truths, there's a lot of principles, and one of the principles, the unity principles, is that w what we think about and what we focus on, what, where we put our choices, is what creates our life, right? So we have to give ourselves permission to see what we're thinking about and what we're focusing on and, and what we're speaking about. We have to allow ourselves to have our own little gauge inside of us that says, you know, on target, in integrity with with kindness or not. And I'm just using kindness as a, you know, one example of all of the many examples of principles that we espouse that it is our job to learn to be who we say we are. It is our job to be the change that we want to see in the world. Um, Brene Brown is one of my heroes. And so I was going to suggest to you that you go to your library or you go to Google and you look up quotes on kindness. But the first one that came to my mind 
um, yesterday as I was putting this together was the first and second commandment. Now I'm not a big Bible person, but I do remember the great commandment. And, um, and so the great commandment is to love Lord our God with all, and, and then it's very specific about the order. I kind of made it up a little differently myself, but you shall love the Lord our God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like unto it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Wow, I thought love our neighbor as ourself. So that makes me look at, in just keeping the frame on kindness, am I kind to my neighbor? Makes me ask myself, am I kind to myself? So then there was a quote in... Um, in the, this month's Science of Mind magazine, and it was from Saint Exupery. You've you've probably heard this um, proclamation. Saint uh, uh, anyway, Saint Augustine's um, proclamation. What we're looking for is what we're looking with. What we're looking for is what we're looking with. Well, I've always thought of that as. Um, the God within is looking out for what we want, which is more expression of the God around. But when I found that quote yesterday, I went, oh, what if what we're looking for is the way we are when we're looking out? What if, if I want kindness, I need to look with kindness? If I want love, I need to look with love. I can't see kindness if I'm not in tune with kindness myself. I can't get there from here. I can't get to kindness about the, you know, the people that want to cut the tree down unless I'm able to get to kindness with myself about life in general and about my relationship with the tree and and my compassion for the people who think they need to make that other decision. So I don't even get to, to love my neighbor as myself, or I'm always loving my neighbor as myself. And sometimes that's not so well. Sometimes I think that I love my neighbor um, in this pure way because I'm a spiritual person and we're supposed to love everyone. But there's a little chatter in my head about, yeah, but why do they do that? And that really, and it's, you know, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I, I can come up with lots of other focus than what's really healthy. And what's really wonderful is that we have the power of choice. And the choice is, for me, is to recognize where I'm putting my attention. So... You know, that's so Jesus had that quote about the great commandments. And so I thought, well, who is who are some of my heroes? Let me see what they had to say about kindness. And I looked up Brene Brown and just see if any of these things strike a chord in you. I just love this. We can't practice compassion with other people if we can't treat ourselves kindly. We can't practice kindness, compassion with other people if we can't treat ourselves kindly. Because how could we be kind to someone else if we didn't know how? Would it be authentic kindness or would it be kindness because that's what you're supposed to do in the circumstance? But real kindness has to be something we're familiar with in order to be able to share it. We can't just do it out of the book that says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We have to know why. We have to know what that feels like, kindness. And we have to know what it doesn't feel like, you know, what, when it isn't kind, when it is pretend kindness, because we're supposed to. 
this is a fine art of self-awareness to see ourselves in those subtle places. And she goes on to say, first and foremost, in another book, first and foremost, we need to be the adults we want our children to be. We should watch our own gossiping and anger. We should model the kindness we want to see. How in heaven's name are children going to grow up if all they see around them is the us and them that is raging in our world today? And, and it is so easy to fall into that trap of us and them. Well, we have the answer because we're unity, right? Or we have, we know the right way to do it because we're spiritual. Or we understand that this is how to get there. So I've been asking myself recently, is there any group of people that really push me over the edge? where I just can't be kind, I can't be pleasant, I can't be nice. I, it just makes my blood boil to think about them or to have to listen to them or whatever. Because right now there is such a polarity that we've got people compartmentalized, those who have vaccines and those who don't, for example. I mean, it is just a ridiculous way to approach this uh, healing uh, opportunity on our planet, as far as I can tell, to be fighting over these things and blaming people and, and all of it. But, you know, who wants to be at risk because somebody's irresponsible? So you can justify your position on no matter what it is. And there's so much justification going on out there. And imagine the children growing up in this environment or your grandchildren, perhaps. Just imagine, I, I'm around four grandkids quite often, and I, I think, am I being, am I modeling the, the kind of kindness that I, I want to see from them? And I get a little nitpicky with my grandchildren sometimes. So half the time it's no, I am not modeling what I'm looking for. I'm, so what I'm looking with is going to show them who I am, being at that moment. And I'm not going to see anything but that in them. I'm going to see all the little picky stuff in them, just like I'm obviously seeing it in me when I'm being like that, right? So when you're in that state of just, you know, something isn't right and you've let it get like a burr under your saddle and it just is constantly irritating. Well, we justify, well, of course, I'm kind of cranky about it because after all, it's not right. And look at John is still doing that after all those things and all those times and it hasn't worked. There he is again. How dare he do that? I mean, have you ever had a conversation like that or witnessed one? You know, I mean, of course, we all have. And so I think that we get what we look with you know, the, Emma Curtis Hopkins um, said something that's paraphrased to say, you don't get what you pray for, you get what you pray from. You don't get what you want, you get what you are. And so if what we're looking at coming out of our eyes and out of our focus and our the way we've arranged our thought process is that's wrong, that's wrong, they shouldn't do that, this is not right. If that's where we are, then that's what we get. That's what we see, that's what we're attracted to, and that's what we attract into our life. Now, most of us are not hopeless cases because we go to Unity Church. We go every Sunday, we take classes, and we have prayer partners, and we're training, we're learning to be the people we were born to be. So I might be the worst case of the bunch. And, you know, who knows? But I can just tell you that I forget myself sometimes and get picky or try to tell someone the truth because I think they need to know it. It would be the kind thing to do, to let them know that they 
shouldn't do it that way. It's going to hurt them. But I'm sure when I think about it is they already know that. So what good does my opinion do? None, except separate us some more. You know, and, and so it's exciting to be able to see yourself and see the, those wrinkles and all those foibles. It's great. So, but you have to let it be great because otherwise you're going to judge yourself and you're going to say, oh, I'm a bad girl there. I'm still doing it. And what's the matter with me? And I'll never be enough. You know, but that's not true. I'm growing and learning. And how can I change unless I see those things? So the Dalai Lama, this is his life story. It's, it's just a wonderful book. It's an open heart. Practicing Compassion in Everyday Life, the Dalai Lama. He has so many wonderful things to say. One of them is, kindness is my religion. My religion is kindness. That's what he says. And um, he said, in a sense, the concept of us and them is almost no longer relevant. Now, there's a radical statement for today's political world. As our neighbor's interests are ours as well. Caring for our neighbor's interests is essentially caring for our own future. Today, the reality is simple. In harming our enemy, we are harmed. Well, that's not new. You know, we've all read those things. But today we're so interdependent that the concept of war has become outdated. Now, there's a phrase I really like. When we face problems or disagreements today, we have to arrive at solutions through dialogue, not through judgment, not through blame, not through trying to get the biggest amount of booty from the other one, but to dialogue and to seek to understand and to, to use the gifts of, of compassion and willingness to see the spirit of all things in all people. Dialogue is the only appropriate method. I used to say we should take anything that wants to be a war and we should play hockey or badminton or, you know, polo. Or no, not polo. Curling or something where you have to work as a team. You know, settle it in some other way because it doesn't, it doesn't work. One-sided one -sided victory, the Dalai Lama says, is no longer relevant because we're so interconnected that what I do to you is immediately come back to me, that what I put out into the universe immediately becomes my reality. We must work to resolve conflicts. Now, I'm not talking about big wars between countries, although that will, you know, it certainly affects that. But those things won't change until we do. Now, we're the ones that have to change. We're the ones that have to practice kindness to ourselves in order to be compassionate with someone else so that we can then settle our differences in a respectful way rather than the biggest voice wins or the crankiest person gets their way because we just want to, you know, just stop having to deal with it or whatever it is. We can't destroy our neighbors. We have to work in the spirit of reconciliation and always keep in mind the interests of the other. That's kindness in action, according to the Dalai Lama. We can never ignore their interests. Doing so would ultimately cause us to suffer. Therefore, I therefore think that the concept of violence is no longer viable or suitable. Isn't that fantastic? That is, you know, revolutionary. It doesn't mean we're indifferent to the problem, he says. We just seek to solve it through understanding and through compassion and listening and kindness. What's possible as we start on these journeys that we're all on like each of us probably is pulled by a certain principle. I don't know what each of yours is. A certain aspect 
of this teaching, this unity teaching. But for me, when I think about the deep, clear connection of all people, that we are all connected to each other because we're connected, we're all from the same source. When I, when I allow myself to really feel that feeling, it's impossible for me to be angry at anyone or to judge them because we're all like part of the same learning organism that's moving along in humanity. The Dalai Lama said, be kind wherever, whenever possible. And then he said, and it's always possible. Just in case you think you have an exclusion, you have some place where it is not possible to be kind. Well, that just ain't so. Just look for it. Don't ever mistake my silence for ignorance. So right now I'm practicing not um, speaking out where I used to to just observe myself without needing to do anything about it publicly. So it's a very interesting practice. Don't m ever mistake my silence for ignorance, he says, Dalai Lama, my calmness for acceptance, or my kindness for weakness. No, compassion and tolerance are not signs of weakness, but signs of strength because we have to give up our little self of knowing and being right and having some opinion about everything to be actually open to the thing that connects us all. What if we believed that these people who drive us to distraction today were as connected to you as you all are in a community that has gathered together out of a shared belief of unity. We cannot be in this room and know and not know that we're all one. And if we're tripping on, you know, somebody's behavior or what they said or what they didn't say or whatever, then it's us that we need to do the treatment for. Because if, if we have any judgment that the only value in that, the only relevance in those things anymore is to get us to look at ourselves. <laughs> Mark Twain said, kindness is a language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. And there is a picture of a man and a dog with that quote. Just think about that. What does your kindness look like? What does it feel like? Would somebody recognize it if they didn't see you, but they just heard you? Would you, would they feel it if they couldn't see you? What's your tone of voice? What's, what's the energy that goes before you when you're being kind? Henry Wadsworth Longfellow says, kind hearts are the garden, kind thoughts are the roots, kind words are the flowers, kind deeds are the fruits. Take care of your garden and keep out the weeds, fill it with sunshine, kind words, and kind deeds. Now, you know, this a couple hundred years ago, it's still true today, I would say. So as we look at this kindness, there's things that we can stop doing which are enable us to be kind to ourselves. Because it has to start here if it's going to be authentic when it goes out there. So while you're me, while I'm busy, you know, I don't use the word helping anymore because it just creates such a separation in my head. But while I'm busy being kind to people who um, have less than I do, I have to understand what I believe when I'm doing that. I have to notice what I feel. 
somebody said the other day the the biggest self-care you can practice is to see everyone else as as connected to you as unity would have you believe the biggest self-care is to know that we're one imagine out of out of getting more sleep and eating less chocolate and drinking 10 gallons of water a day and only juicing and and you know all of those things that we go on these binges about to be healthy and to take care of ourselves sleep enough and be in the sunshine and that the most kind thing we can do to be self-caring is to recognize I am you and you are me we sing about it I am you you are me we are one and in this unity we all live in harmony right and peace shall come because we are one and we all love to sing it and what if we really all practiced it more than we do now what could change I know that the more I practice it the more peaceful I become I am anywhere but a paragon of peacefulness I am not I am a student of peace learning how to put peace first sometimes that's kindness that leads to compassion that leads to deeper listening that allows me to be able to hear the voices that before would just push me over the edge so that I can actually be there and ask what's really wants to happen here what's the root of this pain that's being acted out and where is it in my life and how can I be kind enough to myself to treat myself first to see you as me to forgive as I would seek to be forgiven and the way to grow that in ourselves is to know what you believe about kindness go look it up think about it ask yourself are you kind to yourself the way you live the way you think the way you sleep or eat or talk to your neighbors are you kind or not and where you're not don't blame yourself don't make yourself wrong just say oh goody it's so good we get clear about that so that we can be more of who we want to be so that we can be clear and what's possible when we let go of those ways of not being kind the judgment the blame the the body tension you know how often do we push past the body pain right because you've got to get the job done or you got to do this or it's only you know or I've lived with it forever what what if we could make peace with the the pain in our body so that it's not something we're fighting against that's self-care it doesn't mean the pain might be less but if we make peace with it we're not carrying around our resentment or our anger about it and when we're not carrying around our resentment and our anger we've got more space to be more who we want to be in fact just the choice to be light and gentle with ourselves it doesn't mean not accountable just to be light and gentle with ourselves it allows us to be more peaceful and the more peaceful that we are the easier it is to see the other person as our brother and sister as our relative as as the other side of me but I can't do it when I'm not being self-caring to myself and so what's possible anything anything is possible peace in our lifetime peace in our heart as the guy sang that song when when we keep singing that and we keep choosing that peace in our heart instead of that disappointment and telling the story of how it's hard and it's been hard and la 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 well you know that focus doesn't serve us 
It doesn't put peace in our heart. It puts us in the pity pot or wherever. So lighten up and, and be gentle with ourselves and say, gosh, thank you for showing me this and being willing to be more peaceful. And day by day, choice by choice, you'll have less things to say about everything else and more peace and joy in your heart. I know it's coming. I can feel it. And if it's coming for me, that's miraculous because I have a lot of other qualities that kept it all away. And that means it's coming for the world. And then maybe the Dalai Lama is right. The notion of us and them is an outdated notion. We just haven't found the language and the we haven't laid the track down yet, the path to the better idea. So kindness, it's a great cornerstone for living a peaceful life. It's a great stepping stone to get back on the path of peace. And I just invite you to ask yourself, I know I'm being kind when, or I know I'm being peaceful when, and start building the anticipation or the image, the mental equivalent of how we all are kind and peaceful lots of times. So remind ourselves, I know I'm kind when I listen and am compassionate. I know I'm kind when I seek to understand. I know I'm kind when I, I'm not telling anyone what they need to be doing. Unless they ask, of course. Please ask once in a while, you know, but so I can do th once in a while. <laughs> Anyways. So it's a very deep topic, this kindness, but it's the best self-care. It's such good self-care, which makes our heart beat stronger, our breath go deeper, the oxygen having more room to circulate. Everything gets better when we're kind to ourselves. And so it's a simple thing and it doesn't cost any money. So I, I give it to you as a practice. And to do it in community, imagine the light that could come from this unity community when we practice together to be kind to ourselves and each other. We can have a best practices kindness club. So thank you for letting me in today to share some of the truths that I know and um, some of the things I'm learning and some of the visions of possibilities I have, which is we are learning and it's not too late and we've got to be honest and kind to ourselves at the same time. And when we learn how to do it here, we'll be much better doing it with each other. So there's the gauntlet and I invite us to pick it up and practice. So thank you. May you be filled with loving kindness. So Our breath is a powerful first step at any sign of discomfort. And the power of our breath to calm our autonomic nervous system is so powerful that the science behind meditation, the science behind peace, the science behind kindness is that when we breathe and we serve from that surrendered place, our bodies are happy. Our nerves are 
relaxed. And so I invite us to take just that breath of compassion for ourselves, for all the little ways that we see we could use as stepping stones for ourselves, stumble into kindness, and have compassion for ourselves because we're here learning. And it's a choice to be kind. And so I invite you to hum along with this prayer. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. And may you be happy. And now, taking it even deeper, may I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. And may I be happy. May I be filled, filled with loving kindness. May loving kindness be my choice this week. And I know that as I choose, life has no choice but to respond and bring me that which I am, that which I see, that which I share. And so I open to being more loving and more kind to myself this week. And I notice how it affects all my life around me because that's how it works. And I am so grateful. So may I be filled with loving kindness. May it be so. Amen. <sighs> hmm. Life is so precious, you know. And we just really need to know that at any moment, we can choose to be kind to our friends, right? So I just am happy that I remember today to be kinder. What about you? All right, well, I'll, I'll be kinder. Are you sure? Are you sure? She said, yeah, so that's good news. Have a great week, everybody.